Mobile One The Grid. Coming up today, we go behind the scenes of the six hours of Silverstone and head to the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach. In today on the drag strip with the NHRA's Florida Classic, the Gator Nationals. Gainesville Raceway in Central Florida has been host every year since 1970 to the Gator Nationals, a drag racing event hosted by the National Hot Rod Association of America. It's one of the biggest events on the NHRA calendar that attracts the best drivers and the festive crowd. Hey, there's no more race in the world right here, baby. Gainesville. What a place, man. It's great. It's so big. This is the track that sets all the mile an hour barriers, big speed. The air is always usually good. The best of the best. Everyone comes from all over the world to compete against the NHRA. People not just from Florida, but we all come down this race, and it's like, bam! We light them up with nitro, and that's what they love. And that's what makes this race just so big. National champions Tony Schumacher and Antron Brown attract a huge fan base to the little town of Gainesville. Even rock stars from across the Atlantic have come to see what all the fuss is about. Travels here. Sorry, guys. Everybody, how you doing? I had no idea Tony Schumacher was an eight-time world champion, and uh, you know we got we hit it straight away. Drummer for no, the greatest band to me, rock band ever, uh, Iron Maiden. And let me tell you what, his words to me, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And for a moment, I thought to myself, I bet he's seen some stuff. I'm hooked. I got my face full of nitro from two guys. I was on the line, both of them went off, frightened the life out of me the first time I was standing there. Experienced the nitro, and I swallowed it, went up the nose, it came out the eyes, it was brilliant. A track with a rich tradition of history-making performances, fans get to enjoy watching stock cars, funny cars, and even motorcycles. But the main event and crowd favourite are the Nitro Pump Rockets in the top fuel category, which are fired like bullets down the quarter-mile strip. When you get in that car and the car starts, 10,000 horsepower killing machine, you focus. When you look back and you look around you, you'll see all these thousands and thousands of people just sitting there just waiting to get that adrenaline rush. And that adrenaline rush, when we step on the gas, our car, I call it, it reach out and touches them. It goes out and they go boom and they feel that explosion right here in their chest and then we vibrate them going down the racetrack. It's nothing like it. It's NHRA excitement at its best. Rushes and near misses are inevitable at drag meets, and the Gator Nationals are no different with some spectacular action early on. The heats in the top fuel favor the Don Schumacher racing stable with Brown, Tony Schumacher and teammate Spencer Massey taking three out of the four for the final spot. We're down to four now, but all four of those cars, three of them are DSR cars, and then the Ellen Johnson machine on the other side, so nothing's easy, man. Go out and win the first couple rounds are generally easier on, on race day, but these next two rounds coming up, they're going to be intense and very hard to win. The tracks are going to get hotter right now. The temperatures are above high, above normal that we're used to stand out here. So the tracks are going to get tricky. Unfortunately, Antron Brown would miss out on the chance to battle for another title. Oh. Antron smokes it hard, gets Spencer Massey into the final round. The last two top fuel champions, both any winners is Al Johnson Racing versus John Schumacher. Once again, rising to the top. But it would still be an all-DSR final with Tony Schumacher taking on Spencer Massey for the Gator National Trophy. Here we go. The top fuel final as we wrap up the Gator National. Oh, oh look at that line. Oh, Spencer was ready and he just knocked out the Sarge. Oh, the whole shot. Not this time for Tony, but another great result for Don Schumacher's racing team with a 1-2 finish. It's one of these battles. Everybody doesn't win. We don't all get trophies. And you got to be the guy that can figure it out and suck it up on race day. Next up, we head on to the grid for a double helping of action from the streets of Long Beach. 
And we begin with round three of the United Sports Car Championship in the Californian Sunshine. The Taylor Brothers in Dad's Wayne Taylor Racing for Red TV. Starting up front alongside the Chip Ganassi car of Hander Pruitt. Classic Ford versus Chevrolet Battle in the prototypes. GTLM, Bill Oberlin started from Paul in the BMW. There's the Ferrari of Giancarlo Fisichella, the charge from third into first. At the back, there was contact between the 912 Porsche and Holly Gavin in the Corvette, resulting in both cars dropping out of contention early on. In the prototypes, Joey handed her at the lead during the pit stops, but Jordan Taylor in the 10 car quickly bounced back at turn one, retaking the lead, resulting in Wayne Taylor Racing's first victory of the season. Back in GTLM, Dirk Werner executed a driving masterclass on the street circuit, joining back in seventh at the changeover, he made a thrilling charge to take the lead and hold on to give RLL BMW their first win of the season. An outwardly straightforward race for the Taylors claiming overall victory, followed in second by the Chip Ganassi Ford, it was the Visit Florida Corvette taking the last spot on the podium. Dirk Werner and local favourite Bill Oberlin gave BMW the top spot in the GTLM class, ahead of Reese's Ferrari in second and the number three cover in third. The next day it was the turn of the Indy cars as the 41st running of the Toyota Long Beach Grand Prix brought the roar on the shore to maximum decibels. Juan Pablo Montoya and Paul Sitter Elio Castro Neves fighting for the line into turn one. Montoya had a look up the inside, but Castro Nevis closed the door and look at Scott Dixon go to the outside. Scott Dixon in the solid red number nine target car up to one. second Clear place. On lap 30, leader Castro Nevis in the number three lost valuable time on pit road. Tony Kinnan in the blue number 10 prevented a quick getaway. That would see made Scott Dixon a crucial advantage. Scott Dixon needs points. He has not had a good season today. He leads here at Long Beach. In the tightest section of the racetrack, look at Pagano. Inside, then outside on Montoya. There they are, coming through in the same order. Oh, and Kanan in the blue 10, a little bit loose off the corner. Pagano does have one push to pass left. See the blocking, and Pagano's got to make this as his last chance. Can't get it done there. Can he get it done in the hairpin? There's no way Montoya will leave it open. Scott Dixon wins at Long Beach for the first time. This battle far from done, though. Juan Pablo Montoya in front of Pagano. He's going to hold the position. Bourdais cannot get it done on Tony Canon. And Juan Pablo Montoya holds on to the last podium spot. Montoya leads Penske teammate Castro Neves by three points in the early championship standings. The real celebration belonged to Dixon, the Kiwi claiming his first ever win on the short run circuit. Now we head to Silverstone, UK to go behind the scenes at the opening round of the World Endurance Championship. The WBC is going from strength to strength. An eight race calendar taking in Asia, America and Europe with a 24 hours of Le Mans at its heart. It attracts the biggest players in the industry. Top LMP1 category, three rival manufacturers go all out for victory. We're going to this year with that number one on the car but you know we're up against serious competition and uh, you will have to expect everyone's done the same kind of development curve as you and, uh, and that's what pushes you on. On my side I'm optimistic uh, the team did a tremendous job uh, updating the car from last year so this gives me the confidence that uh, we, we have the stuff to win uh, here in Silverstone, hopefully. I think this weekend we'll find out, yeah, a little bit of a form card for sure. I mean, you can test, you can do simulations, but actually racing is when everyone has their gloves off. You've got to bring your A game and then you'll see what you've got at the end. In 2014, Toyota took the world title, Audi won Le Mans, and rookie Porsche scooped their maiden victory, setting it all up nicely for the new season, kicking off at Silverstone. I've got a lot of great memories here over the years, and uh, it's our second year here now with Porsche, obviously, so we're a lot more organised than we were this time last year, a little bit more relaxed. It's not much, but it's, it's good uh, that the team is uh, a bit more composed. Until the qualifying, it's going to be difficult to be exactly sure of where we stand. We know this circuit in Silverstone is not really good for our car, even so we won and, and finished first and second last year. But we are confident we will have a car to fight. Our competitors, uh, they both are pretty strong, that's for sure. But uh, also we try to, to beat them. We are not uh, afraid about nobody, but we take the challenge and we welcome challengers. 
after a sunny start to the weekend. A little rain reminded the team what race day might bring as practice continued. There was one team not on track, however. After announcing a full season entry, Nissan had been forced to delay their campaign until Le Mans, bringing just a show car and their star driver. It was a tough decision for the for the company to sort of turn down the first two races, but we've had a few slow little setbacks, so you know we, we wouldn't have been ready to be here at Silverstone. There's lots to still learn, and uh, Le Mans is coming around quicker than we thought, but we're, we're really looking forward to it. Back on the racetrack, Porsche's eight Metadual Energy Recovery System saw them looking fastest over a single lap, despite an issue on their number 18 hybrid. We lost unfortunately about one hour because we had a, a drive problem, and uh, but we could solve that. And uh, it's not ideal, but it's also not a nightmare, you know. We we can work around that, and uh, it shouldn't shouldn't harm us for the rest of the weekend. In the end, the Porsches pulled it off in qualifying, putting their pair of LMP ones on the front row. But with all the cars running well, the six-hour race would be a flat-out test that anyone could win. 1,000 kilometers we we have to complete is uh, is pretty much a sprint. There's not much of the car that we need to look after. I mean, keep in mind, Audi, Toyota, and Porsche, all of us are doing 24 or 30 hour simulations in testing. So uh, six hours should be relatively uh, hassle free. That's how it should be. Something always happens in a six hour race. Something out of your control or you know, cutting through the traffic can be. It's pretty daunting in one of these cars. There's a risk factor involved. So it's very much a case of never give up in these races. Silverstone suits our race car, and uh, the only thing is the weather this early in the year sometimes might be a little bit tricky. Uh, last year it didn't help us out really, but um, yeah, we're all stoked to be here and uh, hopefully deliver a good show and a good race. After the break, the race begins in the six hours of Silverstone. And we find out how this car got back onto the stages.